for any risk investment product or service. Uh, we're just trying to convey some information that we hope will be helpful. So with that, those disclosures in mind, um, and we might want to cover those really quickly. There's the first caveat. And the second caveat. Um, so the session purpose is to describe risk adjustment, illustrate the experiences and uses of risk adjustment, to discuss the importance of the data that will be involved with doing risk adjustment. And then we hope to um, help you with some recent developments in risk adjustment as the state of the art has been advancing quite rapidly over the past few years. And then summarize some lessons that have been learned for, from those that have done before you and uh, have ventured out into the risk adjustment area. Hopefully we can learn from them and avoid mistakes that they might have made and build on strengths and, and experiences that they have. So with that, I will briefly cover a couple of recommendations of risk adjustment definitions. And once we've covered those, I'll turn the time over to Diane, who will be covering most of the rest of the presentation. So what is risk adjustment? Risk adjustment is a process of adjusting either health plan payments or health care provider payments or premiums. And the purpose is to reflect the health status of plan members. So that's part of the definition. Risk adjustment is commonly described as a two-step process. The first step involves assessing the relative risk of each individual in the group. What this means is that each individual is assigned a risk score, with one being uh, their, expect, their expected cost to be at the, at the plan average. Once each individual has been assigned a risk score, then the second step is to uh, adjust the payment, or what we call rate adjustment. And so that's where you basically add up all of the individual risk scores for the population that you are interested in and accumulate those into an aggregate and make that as a comparison against other groups that you might be interested in. On the next page, when these risk adjustment methods are based on a lot of data, different types of data, and they use a variety of statistical models to explain their outcomes. So behind the scenes, when you assign the risk score, there are some sophisticated data algorithms that are used um, based on a, on a set of what we call calibration data that um, are used to assign the risk scores. And we'll go into then some of the details about how those risk scores are assigned at the individual level first, and then we will show you some examples of how the uh, individual risk scores are rolled up and used for various purposes that I think you might find interesting. So with that, uh, I will turn the time over to Diane and let her work on the rest of the presentation. Thank you, David. I want to check. Can everyone hear me? Thank you. Uh, the risk adjustment, as David uh, mentioned, it really starts with an individual assessment of risk. And that assessment should minimally classify medical codes or drug co codes into condition groups or disease groups. And sometimes it uses more than medical codes and drug codes, and that depends upon the risk adjuster that you are selecting. And there are a variety of them, and we will discuss that during the presentation. Once the uh, individual is assessed using the information from their current claims or their medical records, then the risk adjuster will calculate a relative risk for, uh, for the person. And it's a relative risk score. And it's characterized as a score that, that you would compare to 1.0, 1.0 meaning average. And most risk adjusters provide one score. And we'll give you an example of that. Uh, it also, um, that score is also used to predict typically resource use or expected cost um, in a projection period. However, there are models that also can predict advanced 
and days and admissions and visits and uh, uh, avoidable um, uh, medical events. And uh, those would be specialized risk adjusters. But the basic risk adjuster that's used for budgeting and payment is one that produces a relative risk score on each individual. On the next slide, um, we are going to provide you with some examples. Now, the examples that we're going to provide you are not from all, all from the same risk adjuster, and I'll give you an example. These are um, completely different patients, and they are they all have a, set, a different set of medical conditions. So, looking at the three individuals, we start with the first one, John Smith. By the way, everything here is fictitious. Um, this is an example of using a DCG HCC model. It's a commercially available model similar to the one used by CMS, but not exactly so. In this example, this risk adjuster, this, the DCG HCC model, produces one relative risk score. And here we see that John Smith, who is age 53 and a male, has a relative risk score of 10.94. What that means is that John Smith is 10.94 times thicker than the average person in the population that just received risk assessment. So when you run a population, the average will be 1, 1.0, and you will compare everyone's score to the average. And it gives you an opportunity to see a difference between the risk of the individual. In addition to that, when you're choosing a risk adjustment method, you also want to be able to see a clinical profile. In this case, what the DCG models produce is an indication of the conditions that this patient has. And here you see that there are a lot of chronic conditions appearing in the information. The DCG model uses diagnosis codes, age, and gender in order to produce this clinical information and the relative risk score. And it's one example. Now let's move ahead, and we'll look at another example. For this individual, we're looking at another male, Dave Wade. And Dave is, I believe, 53 years old. Um, and Dave is, uh, this is using a Milliman advanced risk adjuster called MARA. And in this case, what you see is a variety of information, slightly different. You still see that one relative risk score, 4.244. Again, compared to one, it means that Dave is 4.2 times thicker than average. And you'll also see that this risk adjuster produces uh, scores by service category so that you can review and understand where the uh, the costs are projected to be in the future period. And there's a summary of the medical scores, which are pharmacy, inpatient, and outpatient, and then a total score, which, which adds them all together. In addition to that, there is a clinical profile provided, and that clinical profile gives you a list of the conditions that the patient has that were seen in the medical record or in the claims input. Um, and you can also see the percent contribution that each of these conditions is making to this relative risk score. And that helps you understand a little bit more about the things that are causing uh, concern and um, advancing this, uh, this patient's risk. Now I'm going to move to the next. The next patient is a female patient, Jane Johnson. And here we're using a different type of, of risk assessment method. This is a risk based on a pharmacy profile only. From time to time, you will see that there are no medical claims available. And this often happens when, to, when encounter data are sparse or when it's not collected, or when the data warehouse does not capture very well the diagnosis code, and also um, when, uh, when physicians don't code completely, then often 
organizations will use a pharmacy-based risk adjuster. This risk adjuster, again, is a mar MARA pharmacy-based adjuster. And you'll see here that you get the same type of information only using the NDC codes from the claims. You see that you get information about the relative risk. The total relative risk here is 3.5. That is the score, which means that Jane is 3.5, thicker than average. Average, And you can see that the majority of the spending is it projected to occur in a physician's office, um, quite a bit in the hospital, um, outpatients, and then also in prescription drugs. And her projected cost next year is nearly $15,000. In addition to that, you can see that you can see information about uh, the medications that she's taking. And again, this would be in lieu of having um, medical claims available. Now, the three risk adjusters that we just looked at are basically provide information on three different types. The first one, the DCD models, use diagnosis data and age and gender. The second one used uh, diagnosis data and procedure code data, um, information about the type of provider that was seen. And there's a lot of different information, including some pharmacy data in that model. And then the final model, the RX adjuster, use only pharmacy claims. As you're looking at risk adjusters, you want to think about the data that you have available. The value of risk adjustment is that you really cannot make fair comparisons unless you adjust for illness burden. So it's really a great tool for learning the factors that influence risk, influence cost, and that will affect the outcomes of the patient. When you move beyond risk adjustment, you find out that um, it, you may reveal the need for more controlled studies or more comprehensive observational studies. And this could be about, um, about care, about the influence of different service levels, as well as some, some observational studies on um, particular cohorts of the population. Um, however, more controlled studies may not even be practical due to the cost of doing the studies, the available data, um, and uh, the practicality of it, and the sample size. So risk adjustment is a very good step to take um, and gives you um, excellent information as a starting point. Risk adjustment all by itself um, will give you a lot of information in order to make better decisions because it really makes the data that you already have more intelligent. There are many different types of risk adjustment models. There are concurrent models, which are models that basically predict what should have happened, what, what resources should have been in the current period or in a previous period. And those are used for a number of applications in healthcare. And the prospective models um, can also be used, but these project a future period. And the determination needs to be made about the completeness of the claims and whether or not you're going to use models that um, include a lag period or not. There are also event models. And these are the models that can predict avoidable events such as ER utilization, high cost radiology, and they work very well for utilization management, pay for performance, and care intervention. Um, but they work along with a concurrent or prospective model. Um, so they are not risk adjustment models per se, but they apply risk adjustment techniques um, to, uh, to predict different types of outcomes. And then there are customized models. Uh, customized models may be necessary or they may not. It really depends upon how customized your application will be. And a customized model is one that usually starts with a basic concurrent or prospective model and then adds additional variables or uses a different population or uses more information um, or bisects or dissects information in order to create uh, new types of outcomes. This is an example of uh, looking at risk adjustment uh, results from a, from a population. So here we have a number of patients that were all scored by the risk adjuster. 
and you see here that we're able to stratify these numbers. And because there's a risk score by the service category or the spending category, it would be possible to stratify using any of these subcategories. In this case, what we did was we sorted the population by their expected resource use in the hospital. And the reason you might want to do this is to better understand those cases that are expected to do to more intense and costly resources so that you can target interventions. In addition to this, there are lots of other ways to stratify populations. And one way, uh, additional way, rather than just stratify using risk scores, is to identify cohorts of the population. Because you need a clinical profile and you want to know a little bit more about the population, you may be able to identify those who have asthma and then stratify those who are high cost um, or, um, or at a targeted particular risk score or those who are expected to use the emergency room more frequently or have high cost medications or inpatient use and then also look at them in terms of the impact that you may be able to make. So risk adjustment um, output of the, the output of these models can be used to identify populations for interventions as well. In some cases, you might want to look at uh, populations by expected cost. And in that situation, you're going to want to bin or group people by their expected cost. And one way to do that would be to take the relative risk score and multiply it by the average expected dollars in the future period, and then take each of those individuals and bin them into the cost group. This helps you look at the well and those who are moving toward needing more expensive care, and then also to separate the really high cost and chronic. It helps you take a look at who your high cost cases are going to be. And this is especially helpful for looking at stop loss and reinsurance, pricing, understanding those who might benefit from case management, and from profiling. Now you could do this kind of thinning based on disease, based on region, based on group, based on selection, based on benefit programs, based on health plans, really any type of group for which you can attach an individual to a grouping variable allows you to look at risk scores by these various categories. So because risk adjustment starts at the individual level, and because you can tie individuals to lots of different groups, and assuming that your clinical classification system is very rich, and, and you have that information available from the risk adjuster, then it really supports lots of different comparisons. And in this case, you can see that the comparisons could be by employer, by the funding mechanism. It could be a plan or it could be a program. It could be a benefit, pro, uh, particular benefit type, and by providers in different cohorts of diseases. The reason this is um, good is because it promotes transparency, so you can compare one group to another, and so that people can understand whose patients are sicker, and who has the sickest diabetic patient, or the sickest asthma patient. It also provides a lot of credibility and meaningfulness to report when you are um, comparing populations. It really helps to focus on the variation in the resource use, and not so much on profits and budget variances which really makes the discussion richer and allows you to do better strategic planning. The ability to look at patients by diseases is also um, provides an opportunity to plan better for interventions and to really measure the efficiency of the care. Moving to the next slide. I'm showing you uh, uh, basically how you could use risk adjustment for observing different types of health plans. And this could be used for budgeting, pricing, underwriting, payments, um, it's any, any type of, of budgeting or payment system. Here we see that we're analyzing an entire population of 15,000 members. And those 15,000 members, again, the average score is always going to be 1.0 and the projected 
PMPM is $200. And when we slice those by selected benefit plan, we see here that the PPO has the most, uh, the majority of the population, and they have a relative risk score of only 2% thicker. So that tracks with the um, slight increase in the dollars. The fee-for-service program attracts the sickest population, 1.37 or 37% thicker than average. And the point-of-service program attracts the healthiest. It is a great way to differentiate between benefit plans, and this is um, uh, this is truly one way of looking at different kinds of groups. Now what I did is I took the, the previous slide and just concentrated on the people who were enrolled in the fee-for-service program. There were 377 out of the 15,000. And we noticed in the previous slide that they had an average score that was 37% higher than the entire population. So we can drill further and take a look at the employer groups who are affiliated with this fee-for-service program or enrolled in this benefit type. And we can see that there are three groups who are above average and have um, expected high costs in the future period. This really allows you to target better. Now, as another way um, to look at this is now you might want to target group A, B, and C and you have a better understanding of what the conditions are that are driving the risk what comorbidities, what chronic situations um, are occurring so that you can um, intervene or plan interventions better. It also helps, of course, to budget. Here we're looking at a comparison of three PHOs. And in this situation, what we've done is we're comparing um, a variety of, um, of uh, risk scores. Here we have a population that's 1.15. 15% thicker than average. We have one that's 22% thicker than average and a PHO that's attracting a very healthy population. Um, when you're using aging sex, you cannot differentiate as well as you can when you're using a risk adjuster. This last line shows you that when you adjust for health status, you see that PHOC really has a thicker population, a population that's much thicker than an aging sex adjustment. Um, provide. And it allows you to make better decisions about uh, what is occurring here in these PHOs. And so if we want to identify high disease, how disease is driving these risk scores, we can take a look at how many patients per 10,000 um, based on the disease are, are spread or how the selection looks between these PHOs. What we've identified here is there is a high rate of diabetes and the diabetes is very different between the PHOs listed. You'll notice that PHOC attracts the majority of the diabetics. And not only do they attract the majority, but it appears that they have got a high number with, with chronic complications, acute complications, but many with no complications. What this allows then is for a better stratification and identification of where resources for condition management might be uh, applied. And in order to keep the diabetics at the level of having no complications, to apply different kinds of resources or to tit titrate the intervention based on that. Now, this is a simplistic view of using risk adjustment for funding. I say that because the caveat here on the bottom um, identifies that uh, you don't use just a relative risk score to um, multiply times a budget amount. And again, this is all fictitious information. $150 being the average monthly PMPM PM, times the relative risk score from those previous PHOs would yield a payment per member uh, similar to what you see in the slide here. And you see that because PHOC has much thicker population, that they would get the higher amount of, of uh, budget. But risk adjustment scores alone cannot be multiplied simply by the budget, the average budget, in order to project the payment. It's very important to make another, a number of actuarial adjustments because um, many things might have to be taken into consideration. And that depends upon how many benefit design differences you have, 
what performance programs you're putting in place, whether or not there are carve-outs for mental health or substance abuse or other programs, and whether or not there's stop-loss levels in reinsurance. Now we'll move from risk assessment to risk adjustment. And what I want to do here is really talk about the context. Um, and in the context, what you really want to be able to do is you want to think very carefully about um, how you're making um, risk, how your uh, slides are moving faster than I'm prepared here. So I'm um, going to back up a minute. Um, you want to consider the, uh, the fit, the purpose of the model. So before you choose a model, you want to consider the strengths and weaknesses for each application. So you want to, uh, number one, strategically identify what is the purpose for which you're going to choose a model. And once you know that purpose, some of the questions you want to ask yourself is uh, you know, whether or not the model is complete enough in order to support your application. How stable is the model over time? Does it have you know, large swings in it every time it's recalibrated? How frequently is the vendor updating the model with, with procedure codes and diagnosis codes and drug codes? Um, those new ICD-9s and NDC codes that comes out, it's really important that those are kept up to date. What is the cost of managing the model? And um, how much support do you get uh, to do simulation and to implement, uh, to recalibrate or to customize if need be? So these are all in the form of uh, bullet points, but, but uh, questions you want to ask yourself. So if you're going to be comparing provider plant panels, uh, it requires assessments of patients who make up the provider practice. In other words, are you able to assign members to provider practices, and have you identified how you're going to do that? If you're going to compare risk by region, do you have the data to support it? Um, do you have the data to support different health plans by plan type? Or the ability to compare patients who opt in or out of disease management programs? So you want to ask yourself if you have that data uh, in order to support um, those kinds of programs. Another important contextual question that you ask is, uh, what is the outcome you expect to predict? Um, do you want to predict next year? Um, will you be using a future period? Uh, what's the claim flag? Um, do you need to use data that is not yet complete? And then does the risk adjuster allow you to create a completion? Do you want to be able to compare the risk score to a benchmark? Um, do you want to predict dollars, days, visits? Um, do you want to be able to predict categories of service or just one relative risk score? A lot of these questions really depend upon what your program uh, strategy is and what you want to accomplish. You also want to make a determination about whether or not you're going to be using a concurrent model or a prospective model. Concurrent models do the best job of explaining what already happened. And they're often used for profiling and outcome analyses. Some organizations use them for payment. However, prospective models are most often used for payment and budgeting. But organizations can make a determination to use either. The prospective models are the ones that are used for care management, risk gratification, pricing. And um, it's important to know what the strengths and weaknesses and the things to consider in concurrent and prospective payment uh, models as you're making your decision. The other con contextual question is the population. So the question is, do you have sufficient population? Um, do you have you know, 75 people in the panel, or are there 7,500 or 750,000? Um, the other question is, um, will you be assessing everyone, regardless of the coverage? Are they commercially insured? Are they Medicaid? Is it a mix? Are they Medicaid and uninsured? Are they um, Medicaid um, and Medicare? Are dually eligible? 
um, other disease subsets that you want to look at. So ask all these questions and uh, before you choose a model. Because different models um, will fit uh, populations uh, differently. And then finally, you really want to understand your available data. What data do you have um, in order to support risk adjustment? If you have a good amount of administrative claims and enrollment data, you, you need a minimum of 12 months uh, of clinical information, medical claims. If you're using pharmacy data only, then a six months worth of pharmacy data will give you a pretty good indication of risk, especially for the chronic population. But you really want 12 months to make the best prediction. You can use EMR data, but you often don't know anything about eligibility when you're using EMR data. Survey data can be added uh, if, in fact, it's complete and, uh, and it's, uh, it's credible. There's a lot of other variables that can be added to existing predictive models um, if you want to do customization. So uh, don't rule out uh, the opportunity to um, build upon your data and add more variables as, uh, as the years go on and as your strategy uh, develops. There are applications, um, many of them, of using risk adjustment in Medicaid and uh, some in the uninsured population. In the Medicaid applications, clearly academic studies are rich and there's many actuarial analyses. Uh, state, state, uh, states have used risk adjustment and health plans who participate in risk-based payment programs with states and have good experience. Um, and so they, they're beginning to have a very good understanding of risk adjustment, um, especially in Medicaid managed care. And it does indicate that where there are competing fee-for-service plans, there is definitely a variation in selection. And you can see that. Member risk scores really help you understand the difference. And I showed you that by explaining differences by the, the illustration, the visual that showed plan type. Some of the variation can really be explained by the type of provider networks um, uh, in a geographic area. And some can be uh, explained by the disease, diseases, the prevalence of disease where you might see, for example, a rare condition like hemophilia higher in one geographic area because of genetic than in another. So there are some opportunities to look at rare or distinct diseases as well. Um, and risk adjustment really promotes plan and provider participation because, uh, again, because of transparency, everyone having a better understanding of the selection. And uh, when you put together your payment system, it really allows you to think through all of the criteria that would go into your um, actuarial algorithm in order to create the budget that uses risk adjustment. Um, there is um, a very well-known researcher, uh, Richard, Rick Kronick um, from, uh, from San Diego, who has a risk adjuster that is um, available at no charge. And it's called CDPS. And I uh, include this information for you uh, because uh, Rick developed models uh, for Medicaid. Um, and that occurred back in uh, the late 90s. Um, those models uh, were developed specifically for Medicaid and on Medicaid fee-for-service and really focused on um, the disabled population within Medicaid. So they do a good job in um, creating a view of risk for the disabled population. Um, and many states use CDPS. But more and more states are beginning to use more advanced risk adjusters. And the reason for that is because uh, a, a lot of times the early adopters, and this is not just early adopters, but it's continuing today that organizations, whether it's states or health plans or provider groups, are experiencing a lot of implementation challenges. And there's really a good recipe for making sure that your implementation planning is very rich. Um, and one of the things, one of the basic things to do is to start with the context that we just went through uh, before you make a, cho a choice and reviewing your, your current data. Um, understand your coding data, your incomplete claims. Are, are physicians coding at the three-digit level for ICD-9 
or at the five? Are they refining those codes? Are they writing down um, procedure codes uh, for everything that they do? Are they um, putting the information um, on the patient chart to really have a better understanding of, um, of the code systems? Uh, for example, it is often very, very uh, interesting and unfortunate to find that people with chronic conditions um, aren't always coded year over year with that chronic condition because sometimes they don't show up um, for care and they need to be managed. So uh, it, uh, it begs for um, better programs to assure that people with chronic conditions are seen by providers and then also that those codes are captured year over year. Because remember, risk adjustment will use the codes from the most recent 12-month period of claim or from the 12-month period that you select. So it's, it's very important to code for chronic conditions and really to code well for everything. Also, some risk adjusters um, are indicating some material swings in the risk. Um, and a lot of this um, needs to be examined. Pharmacy models, for example, can show a lot of swings in risk adjustment because they are more apt to reflect a real utilization um, rather than um, what's, what's wrong with the person because it doesn't, they don't reflect some of the care that's provided, what provider and the type of provider, the procedure codes, and many of the other um, things that are happening with the patient. Um, it's very important to realize the complexity of uh, applying risk adjusters. Uh, running risk adjusters, you know, creating input files and running the models and looking at the results is uh, not necessarily the challenge. The challenge is really in how to implement and how to apply them appropriately. Um, we're 10 years now, or, or greater actually, it's almost more like 15 years uh, since the broader adoption of risk adjustment. And risk adjustment has become mainstream. Um, it really is the predominant model in Medicare. There is a very specific but skinny model used for Medicare called the CMS HCC model. And then there are other models. There's a, a model that was designed for Medicaid to reflect disability. Um, there are, uh, there, there's beginning to be some work on uninsured. Uninsured populations, by the way, have a tendency to look much more like the commercial population. And many, uh, many studies and applications by Medicaid Managed Care indicate that commercial models fit the Medicaid Managed Care population much better than Medicaid models. Uh, and there are some studies, there are some publicly available documents to provide um, additional insight, um, as well as experiences by uh, actuaries and by health plans. Um, it really uh, can be used for all of the budgeting and planning, but don't forget payment and profiling and care management and performance measurement. Um, it's important that uh, implementation is planned well. This is where communication comes in. It's very important to involve the stakeholders in understanding risk adjustment, in understanding the data issues, and in having a good plan to overcome data issues and also to buy into the risk adjuster that's being used so that everyone feels that it, uh, it meets their needs. There is no perfect risk adjuster. Uh, no risk adjuster includes every single data element that you wish it would. However, models are, be are getting better, and in fact, that can be made to be better um, by providing more input. And if you have the input, then those can be added as variables, or they can be observed about impact before the variables um, occur. These risk adjustment models um, are definitely improving. It is not necessary to wait for data to improve uh, to make models better. Um, but the most important thing is that um, you assure that you've done simulations. Uh, states that work very closely with health plans and provider constituents throughout the preparation and implementation phase uh, have more success with risk adjustment. And uh, this, this is true in, in uh, my own experiences uh, when I've worked with, um, with states and providers. Um, stakeholders are always better positioned uh, to drive cost control and quality initi initiatives when the data are, uh, are good and continue to grow 
um, and if you know the weaknesses of the data in advance, um, you can compensate that um, with other um, types of workarounds and planning for the future. Um, these uh, simulations um, are important, especially if there are data anomalies um, or if you want to use additional data or you want to make sure that your model fits the best it possibly can, um, you definitely want to uh, do simulations. And then finally in my presentation, I have some information um, on model fit. Um, I believe the fit of the model, and in fact what that really means is if you have identified your population and you know what you're trying to do, what is the, how does the model really fit your, your objective? So um, it's very important, and again, I can't stress the simulations enough. But the selection should not be based solely on the cost of the risk adjuster. Um, and sometimes it is based on that. And it's unfortunate, because it can also cause you to be disappointed or disillusioned because you've chosen a risk adjuster based purely on cost. Um, and so, so the important thing is to evaluate or to do a lot of research and get experiences. Um, most importantly, recognize that risk adjustment is really part of a larger context. It's a portion. It's really um, one of the ingredients in your entire recipe for reform. And it's, there are some complex financing and measurement issues that you want to put in place. And definitely reporting, management of the data, management of the risk adjustment uh, process, uh, the timing of it, the updates to the code, and the updates to risk adjustment. Are you going to do it quarterly? Are you going to do a rolling 12 months? Um, how frequently will you adjust rates as a result of risk adjustment? Um, risk adjustment won't solve rate inadequacy. Um, but again, it's part of your formula. Um, and it's a very important part of the formula. Um, the final um, information in, in terms of understanding the fit and giving you some objective information is to look at uh, modeling uh, or look at evaluating the performance of the model. Um, and I'm showing you here a study that was performed for the Society of Actuaries in 2007 and then simulated again in the past year in order to add a recent risk adjustment model. Um, Milliman performed the study at the direction of the Society of Actuaries, and it is a published study available at the Society of Actuaries website. Um, and uh, it, you can get access to the study if you uh, would like to read it. It's a very long study with a lot of charts and graphs uh, and performance metrics. I'm going to point out uh, one table from the study, um, and this, this is a a study that was done by selecting risk adjusters and then creating one specific data set so that all risk adjusters, adjusters would be run on the same data using the same time period. And it is the model not recalibrated, but whatever the risk adjusting vendor provides right out of the software. It's prospective, so it's projecting next year. There's no lag built in. And we wanted to look at model performance without adding prior cost. Prior cost actually um, takes into account um, a lot of uh, differences in rate negotiations um, and uh, can color the results of the model. So we're looking at the one without prior cost. There are two metrics that we're looking at. One is an R squared, which is a metric that that helps you understand how much or what percentage of the results are explained just by the model. And then also at a mean average prediction error. And here you want a low mean average prediction error and a high R square. We truncated all the claims at 250,000 uh, in order to remove the outliers and in order not to bias the results. Again, there's a lot of information on, uh, uh, that you can read about this uh, in the Society of Actuaries paper. In this comparative slide, we are comparing models that Milliman designed, models that are designed by Johns Hopkins called the ACG models. The models that are designed for uh, Medicaid disability 
the CDPS model, the clinical risk group from 3M, the DCG model from DSCG. Um, and these are, they're broken by the type of data they use in order to make the prediction. There are some models that use diagnosis and medical data um, from claims. And there are models that use pharmacy data only. And there are models that use a combination of pharmacy and um, medical data. And each of these models is designed to solve for a different uh, business problem. Um, some, of these co some of these models, for instance, uh, the advanced risk adjusters and the clinical risk group from 3M, they use diagnosis plus um, other information from the medical claims. So they'll use uh, a combination of procedure codes as well. Um, and the pharmacy models all use pharmacy and age and gender. And these advanced risk adjusters will use um, all, the, all the information from the medical and the pharmacy as well as uh, utilization uh, in order to make the prediction. Some of them use prior cost, but keep in mind that we are not looking at models that use prior cost in this slide. So when you look at the performance of the models, you want a high R-square. And high R-square means that the models uh, perform better in predicting next year's cost. Now, as I said, no model is perfect. And the highest R-square that you see here is roughly 29%, which means 29% of the expected spending is going to be explained by the model. And then you also want to look at um, a lower MAPE because you want this, you want to have um, an actuarial measurement, mean average prediction error, to be low, low error. And this gives you information on how models perform on a commercial population. But it is by no means the only measure that you should look at. You also want to evaluate the clinical output, uh, what information is provided, and then you want to identify whether or not the model can be recalibrated and how well it compares on a recalibrated data. This next slide is um, really only one slide that comes out of um, a presentation um, that was uh, presented at a conference here, the um, HCCA conference in 2008. Um, and if you would like a copy of this uh, study, we can also provide that for you. But this is an example of taking a look at models, different models, and working on a simulation of two different models. And this was done for Mass Health, um, where they were looking at what models fit best for looking at uh, fee-for-service and Medicaid in the state of Massachusetts. And so you'll notice here that this is, again, the R-square performance measure that explains how well the model performs. And the two models compared here are a DCD HCC model, a CDPS model, which is the Medicaid disability model. That has, and, and this model is calibrated on the Massachusetts data. The CDPS model, uncalibrated, unrecalibrated, which means it comes right out of the software, has a very low R-square for Massachusetts. It doesn't necessarily mean that it will have a low R-square on another state, but in Massachusetts, it's very low. Once it's recalibrated, in other words, it's applied to the data from the Massachusetts fee-for-service and Medicaid population, and those weights in the models have changed, it still it has a very good increase in the R-square, but still not as high as uh, the DCG model. Now, when comparing different simulations um, here, Massachusetts chose to simulate two different models. Uh, other states will simulate other models, or you, you can simulate more than two, um, or, or you can choose a model um, without simulation, but it would not be the recommendation. In summary, I want to emphasize that risk adjustment is really on the individual uh, basis, and you want to be able to see as much information in that individual risk as fits your purpose. So if all you're going to do 
is budget, and you only need one score, and you're not concerned about clinical output, you can choose the model based on that. But if you really want to engage in a model uh, and only have to run one model or two models, rather than licensing very many models, then you want to make sure that the assessment that you're doing on every single individual really gives you more information for medical financing. And medical care delivery is also important because you are going to want to use the model for care intervention planning and for performance measurement and outcome measurement. Pick your risk adjustment method very carefully and use the context. State your purpose. Get together. Do your planning. Understand your data. Where are the strengths and weaknesses? How frequently is it refreshed? And how frequently do the models refresh the codes that are going to be needed? What outcomes do you want to predict? What is the population that you're going to apply? Is it just a population in a nursing home? Or are there many children and, and families? Does it look more like an uninsured commercial uh, population? Does it look more like Medicaid managed care? Or is it a blend of all types of individuals? What time frame do you want to risk adjust last year and project next year? Then you would want a concurrent and prospective. Or will you be doing more than that? And then definitely your model fit is really the important um, piece. And that's done with simulation. I'll take questions now. Great. We have a couple of um, people who have raised their hands. So, um, and we're also joined by um, Margaret Flinter, one of our co-chairs, and Tori is on the line as well. And I don't. I will give them first shot at asking questions if they'd like. Hi. Thanks. And uh, that was just a brilliant presentation. Um, I don't have any questions at the moment, other than I immediately want to go get the model and apply it to my very diverse patient population <laughs> and begin predicting clinical outcomes and use it for care coordination. Um, but I, I don't have any immediate questions, so I'll defer to Tori or others. Well, we have Diane's and David's um, emails now, so they will be really sorry they put that. that on there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tori, did you want to ask any questions? Tori? We were having a little trouble hearing Tori before. I will ask, uh, Linda Green had a question. Could you discuss the potential to use risk scores to adjust performance measures and outcomes, such as hospital readmissions and HEDIS scores? Mm -hmm. uh, a risk adjuster can be used um, in order to adjust uh, different uh, metrics. And risk adjusters have been used, for example, to adjust episodes of care. In other words, a risk adjusted episode. And there are uh, there's some unique techniques um, that would have to be applied in order to use the risk adjuster. So in other words, for readmission, you would want to use a risk adjuster for those people who were readmitted. So you would want to carve out that population and then evaluate the fit of the risk adjuster for that particular purpose. Um, and you can actually use a risk adjuster to um, evaluate different kinds of utilization. Um, it would be uh, predicated upon really what you're measuring and what you want to adjust and how you want to make those adjustments. But definitely, uh, that is a very smart application for risk adjustment. Great. Um, Fred Fletcher is asking, can you give a source that compares specific risk, risk adjusting models? Important comparisons might be the purpose or context addressed, data requirements, cost, what risk, in quotes, concept is used, visits, dollars, pre premature death, quality adjusted life years lost, or whatever. Uh, I would I would like to understand um, the first part of that. Question. He asked about a source that compares the specific risk adjusting models. The um, the most recent uh, published study of that comparison uh, was done by the Society of Actuaries, uh, one that was published in 2007. It gives you some information, but it really steered away from the kind of robust. Uh, evaluation that you're describing. Um, definitely all the vendors will give you an assessment of how their risk adjusters compared, but an independent source um, would really be the best approach to take. There is no 
up-to-date evaluation. Uh, CMS did do an evaluation of risk adjusters for Medicaid um, fee, in other words, fee for service and managed care. And that was done several years ago um, and uh, maybe dated at this point. Um, I would encourage uh, I would encourage you to uh, basically uh, you know, seek a source, um, an independent source, to help you in this, that evaluation. There really is no one unique source that has published that, but there are you know, many experts who have experience in risk adjustment and can help you with that process. And many have been many of those have been done privately. Okay, Alan Mayhew asked if you could say more about how a provider practice would use this tool for pricing, managing payer contracts. I'd also like to add to that, um, you know, how a patient-centered medical home might use that in coordinating care if they know, for instance, that someone has, um, you know, just knowing that someone's expensive isn't as helpful as knowing some of the more um, granular information that you described that they're more expensive, say, on mental health services or maybe on prescriptions. That's actually an excellent question and a complex question. Uh, number one, there are many different uh, types of medical homes and many different types of accountable care organizations. Some are focused only on primary care and are looking for primary care payment arrangements, and some are focused only on, or focused on global capitation or global payments. Uh, in many, there are carve-outs. Um, and so, the, again, the first thing to do is to understand what the strategy and objective is. Um, and once you know that, then you want to determine how well a risk adjuster, um, in its present form or in a, in a calibrated form, can address how you want uh, to, to build your medical home payment system and then how you want to use it for care intervention. So the two, the two things that I would um, suggest you think about is, number one, in addition to a relative risk score, what, are you getting one relative risk score or will you be able to look at the different categories of spending and how are you going to be able to do that and which ones are important to you and so that you want to understand what's in those categories. So when it says, and it says uh, primary care, is it a certain type of primary care? Does it include only family practice? Or would it include primary care physicians who may have a subspecialty um, in treating asthmatic and congestive heart failure and gastrointestinal diseases? So how rich is the primary care system? What, is the, what are the things that the primary care physician will be accountable for? And does the model uh, take those into account? The second thing you want to understand as well is what clinical information are you getting from the model? Uh, number one, what clinical information from the claims that's being used by the model really helps you understand um, how it makes its prediction. So models that will only use diagnoses will, uh, when you have two patients that look identical, they will have the same relative risk score. But when you have um, when, you, when you have a model that uses more than diagnosis data, it will use diagnosis data, the type of provider, it will use uh, information on the, where the service took place, procedure codes, whether someone had surgery or not. It will calibrate for severity and prevalence of the disease. And that will give you, number one, a, a richer risk score. Um, it, it will also give you the output. But you want to verify that you really get the information out of the model that's going to help you make clinical decisions. In other words, if you get a relative risk score, do you also know which of the conditions, someone has 10 conditions, which condition is driving that relative risk? And is the spending um, for pharmacy expected to be high? Um, or is the spending for inpatient? Uh, so that you can, again, you can sort, you can stratify, and you can use that information for planning your intervention. And then you can also use that information for performance measurement. Because if you understand the type of patients you have, the prevalence of disease, how many people have chronic conditions, how many people have multiple chronic conditions, and they're expected to be very high cost, 
how would you apply or titrate disease management? Um, you want to be able to differentiate between the types of diabetes and some of the other um, uh, conditions. Great. Um, Tori Westbrook has a question. Tori, are you there? Tori, we, we're having trouble hearing you. Um, Tori, why don't you put your question into the question box because we're not hearing you. Um, and in the meantime, I will ask Keith as a question. Keith um, Mulligan, uh, the sustenance plan will probably need risk adjustment for several different purposes. For example, to determine payments for providers and for monitoring quality of care. It may be a problem if a risk adjustment model is not calibrated for each of these purposes or gives different results for different outcomes. How can sustenance use risk adjustment for purposes that may be very different and give different results? Well, most of the risk adjustment models, uh, <coughs> once you understand them and once you understand how you're going to apply them, many of them will work very well for budgeting and payment and for performance evaluation. But you may find, because of your strategy and because of the way you are designing the system in your medical home program, that you would, you would want a customized model. Um, and it's hard to evaluate that without having a better understanding of the different types of programs that you will have. So for example, if you want models for performance measurement, and if you know that you have high utilization of radiology, you may want a model that uh, predicts high cost radiology, and you may want to use that for performance measurement. You may want a model that predicts admission. Um, and that can usually be um, designed and needs to be designed uh, uh, customized specifically for your program. Um, an off-the-shelf model, uh, especially a utilization model, may not be appropriate. It really depends upon your design. This is why I really recommend that you start with design uh, before you choose models. Really understand um, the, progr the programmatic. Um, and then an expert or someone with, um, with a lot of experience in evaluating models and helping you choose models can, um, can guide you. Great. Um, Tori asked if there are any states nearby using risk adjustments in paying physicians. Um, he asked if Massachusetts is doing that. Uh, to my understanding to date, uh, Massachusetts is paying health plans, uh, both for the Connected program um, as well as for Medicaid. Um, however, uh, the payment, direct payment by state to providers um, may only be done in a pilot situation or perhaps in a community service clinic, um, but there is there's no real data on that available today. Okay. Um, Keith had another question that I would like to add to. Um, he asked, he says the sustenance program will include some very different diverse populations such as state employees and Medicaid patients. How can the risk adjustment models take account of very different populations? And I have a question as well because patient, uh, the provider rates paid for uh, the same services to state employees and to Medicaid patients are very different. So when you talk about the costs of people, does that take into account the price as well as the number of services? Can you disentangle those two? Uh, the risk adjustment model uh, will predict relative risk, and relative risk will be um, will always be as compared to the total. So one of the things that you could consider is um, dividing up the populations between those that are um, commercially or, or uh, employed and those that are not, and running them separately, and then looking at your average to each. Um, it would require you to run two different populations, but then you can compare uh, you can compare them, and then you can run them all together and see how well um, they, uh, they compare um, to each other. Uh, so there's, again, it, it depends upon your simulation. Um, some Medicaid populations, again, depending upon whether or not this is a managed Medicaid population, I'll give you an example. Um, a, a managed Medicaid population such as Canada um, and uh, certain income levels, 
lots of children, will look more um, like the commercial population, again, depending upon the risk adjuster, but their utilization and their patterns of care are more like the commercial population, possibly except for the use of emergency room visits. And depending upon your risk adjuster, if the risk adjuster uses as input the source of the data or the source of the diagnosis code and the source of the procedure code, it will be able to differentiate between um, people who use services from high cost uh, uh, locations such as hospitals versus from primary care. It will take that into consideration, but not all models do. Um, if you want to uh, differentiate between uh, those populations, then you would do that by using model comparison or perhaps customizing a model, depending again what utilization parameters you are trying to, uh, to refine. Great. I think Tori's microphone is working now. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Good. I don't know if you had anything else to ask. Um, no, I, I appreciate the perspective that the presenter is giving us. More, than, more importantly, um, the uh, you sound like there's a lot of variance in the risk adjustment. How how do states or plans go about kind of weeding out which uh, which which risk adjuster they're likely to use? Is it based on any any sound science? Well, many of the states um, who adopted risk adjustment uh, several years ago um, adopted risk adjusters based on Medicaid, um, uh, Medi Medicaid uh, models. And so, for example, many states today use CDPS. And, and CDPS is designed more for disabled populations. So if, you are, if you're managing or caring for moms and children, your risk scores will always be very low in comparison to a disabled population. Um, and that's one of the slides that I showed with the, diff the fit of a population or the fit of models. States are beginning, uh, and again, just beginning, to adopt um, other models. Uh, I know that uh, the state of New York um, adopted uh, the 3M model, CRG. Um, which is on one of the slides, uh, clinical risk groups. Um, and, uh, and I can't uh, vouch for how that's working uh, right now. I think it's been in place now for a year. Um, but some of the states, such as Florida, for example, um, who did not have good encounter data, started by using the pharmacy model, the CDPS pharmacy model, and they are in the process now of evaluating um, making a change. Um, and so I think you're going to begin to see more and more states um, evaluate models rather than choosing a model because it is designed for fee-for-service Medicaid. Keep in mind that, um, that a lot of the states started using risk adjustment before they started making payments, risk adjusted payments. They used them first to evaluate differences in the population and they stayed with those models. Sometimes they stayed with the models because of the cost of the model, um, the fees charged by the vendor. Um, but it then requires them, it requires you to make a change a couple of years later because of disillusionment or disagreement or um, that it doesn't seem to be doing what you expected to do. Um, it can, in fact, be more costly. I, I wish I could tell you that there is a single source um, of a complete evaluation, um, but there isn't, and I would expect that that would, that would become less so because each of the states are, are going to be adopting different types of programs, different benefit programs. Some are combining them with medical home and some of them are not, um, and so it, it really has to be um, done based on your own experiences and needs primarily. Um, uh, low 
Is Ellen asking a question? Diane, are you still there? Mm -hmm. the, um, the ability to add additional variables um, will, it actually means customization and recalibration. And in order to recalibrate or customize, you have to have a sufficient amount of data. And you want to determine, so for example, compliance rates or visit rates, um, you want to make sure that when you use a variable like that, that you use it judiciously. You may, in fact, not want to put it into the payment model because it may, um, it may cause instability over time as the visit rates change. It might impact what risk looks like. You need to understand what contribution to the risk score that those kinds of variables make. And so it is a process of, um, it's a statistical process of, number one, having the data available in order to simulate what, uh, what the risk might look like if you differentiate. The other way to use that data, is, in fact, if it is not fully complete or you don't have enough observational data, um, is to use it as a marker, to use it as a flag. So that when you when you're risk adjusting or when you're running a risk assessment, you can use those variables initially to flag people with um, language issues or different types of rates. If you have rates available, if you have zip code clusters available, that information can be used um, for lots of performance opportunities. Um, it doesn't always have to be bound up into the payment, and in fact, there may be good reasons not to put it in the payment, but to use it for a performance model uh, in a very different way. It all depends upon what the data suggests. Great. Um, Jennifer Jaff and Drew Morton, are you both there? They had raised their hands, but maybe they've, uh, maybe they've gotten their question answered. Uh, well, it looks like we have one more question. We're probably at the end of... Um, Diane's generosity here. Um, if we choose a Keith von Eibing is asking, if we choose a risk adjustment model, how will we be able to evaluate how well it is working? Um, can models be recalibrated to make them more accurate? Uh, yes, models can always be recalibrated uh, to make them more accurate. Keep in mind that um, recalibration does require um, that your data be used for that recalibration. Um, and there should be a sufficient amount of that data. In, um, and for the purpose, you want to, the, you'd want to recalibrate for a specific purpose, whether that be for payment um, or it be for another process. Um, to my knowledge, every model can be recalibrated. Uh, some of them are more costly to recalibrate than others, but um, all of the models will, will cost something to recalibrate. Um, you can, you can gain a very good understanding about how well a model works by using two to three years of existing data and running simulations. So if you run models year over year and you see how the risk is explained in comparison to the actual, it's a very good way to understand how that model might perform for you in the future. And then um, as an ongoing process, you, you want to continuously monitor your risk adjustment performance, not just the uh, risk adjuster itself, but the information that it's providing for you and how you're using it. That's a, it's an ongoing process. Well, great. Thank you very, very much, Diane. Um, you will be very sorry you gave us all your email um, address. And um, this video, this will be a video of this, it will be up on the website soon and the slides and we um, will continue our discussions. You'll be getting a draft report from Tori and I soon and you all can comment on it and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much.